has brought us another beautiful day uh, to be able to come here today and to worship and praise God and to be in the fellowship with one another. Uh, the scripture we're going to be in uh, Numbers chapter 14 again, and uh, God has kindly allowed me to take this journey with you, uh, with the Israelites wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years, and the things that they did that, that brought them to that place. Uh, of disappointing God each and every time that He turned around. So we're going to pick it back up today in Numbers chapter 14, verse 26. Um, I will be referencing some other scriptures as I go down through here. And I don't know not everyone has been here for every one of the sermons, but there's been a message in each and every chapter and verse that we've been doing. So no doubt there's another there's another uh, something to be taught today. Amen. And uh, so if, if you remember in the last chapter, those of you that were here, those that weren't here, so that you understand what's going on, is, is, is the children of Israel tempted God ten times. Ten times they tempted God. And every time that God turned around, they were murmuring and complaining about everything. And I know sometimes in our lives we might catch ourselves murmuring and complaining instead of being grateful to God and being thankful to God. Uh, so the last chapter was God was ready to destroy them. He told Moses, I will destroy Israel and I will make a great nation out of you. But Moses, being the biggest or one of the biggest intercessors of prayer, you know what I love about what he did was is he, he used a little psychology on God. You might think, well, how can you use psychology on God? Well, Moses had a very close relationship with God. But what you need to take from that Scripture is, folks, and, and I said it the last time, we were created in His image. Okay? So he has feelings. He gets jealous. He loves. He hates. Amen. He mourns. He has feelings. And there's not one thing that you cannot go and talk to God about. You can confide in Him. That's right. um, my wife touched on several things that I'm going to be touching on today is they did not trust Him. After all that He did, how many things does God have to do in your life today before you will trust Him? How many times does He have to answer a prayer? How many times does He have to bail you out of a situation before you trust Him and know that He's going to be there for you? Folks, if you can't trust God, you've got a problem. Amen. Because people or men may let you down, and you may have some trust issues with them because they've done you wrong, they lied to you, they betrayed you, <laughs> they hurt you, whatever, whatever it is. But God, you can trust. As sure as God lives today, we can trust Him. So Moses used a little bit of psychology on God. He said, God, if you destroy them, what is that going to say to your enemies? You told you did all these miraculous signs and all these things before our enemy's eyes. And now you're going to tell them that you couldn't even get your children to the promised land after you promised it? Moses said, that's going to take away from your glory, Lord. So God spared them. Again, for the tenth time, He spared them. And I guess I shouldn't say it that way because God knows He has spared me I don't know how many times for the stupidity and the dumb things that I've done in my life. So I thank God that He's been patient enough with me that I'm still here today to be able to stand before you. How many times has God bailed you out? I mean, really, think about your life and the mistakes that we've all made and we all make them and we're all sinners. And as long as we continue in these flesh bodies, we will continue to mess up. But you know what the difference is? You will repent. Because you love God. That's right. Amen. And that's the most important thing is you repent and you get up every day and try to do what's right. Amen. You know how much God loves that that you care enough about Him to get up and try to do better? That's right. He loves that. So we're going to pick it up and we might be wrapping up this. When I wrap up this chapter, it might be the last one in this segment, but we'll go wherever the good Lord leads us. Amen. Um. In the verse I quoted the last time talking about being able to talk to our Father in Isaiah 43, 26, God even says, keep me in remembrance 
He's like, remind me of my promises. God's got over 12 billion souls that He deals with daily on a daily basis. Now, could you imagine that? Now, imagine all the ones that whine and cry and murmur and carry on in His ears all day long. I'd go insane. But He says, keep me in remembrance. I'm a busy man. He wants you to remind Him of the promises that He has made to you. And He's okay with that. All right, so you can trust God. Alright, so we will pick it up. So now, what we're going to start with here is the punishment. And I can't help to say this every time I get on this subject is, yeah, He forgave them. He didn't destroy them. But there's going to be punishment. And there's too many Christians today that are taught that, well, because I repented, I'm not going to suffer the consequences of my actions. It doesn't work that way. Amen. Folks, that karma is already out there. For whatsoever a man soweth, so shall he reap. He didn't destroy them. He didn't kill them. He had compassion on them. But now here comes the punishment. And, and what happens in this chapter is absolutely unbelievable to me. After all that they've been through and everything that has been done, they still don't trust Him. Alright, so verse 26, chapter 14. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, So here comes the punishment for those who tempted him ten times. Verse 27. Or, yeah, verse 27. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmurs against me? I have heard the murmuring of the children of Israel which murmur against me. They still do not believe him. They still do not trust him. And I'm asking you today, do you believe and trust in God? I hope you do. Because He's there for you. You can trust Him. Uh, these people will be destroyed for their lack of knowledge, their lack of faith and trust in God. And I can't help but think of the verses in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. It says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness that is in them that perish... Folks, for them that perish. You know why they perish? Because they receive not the love and the truth. What is the love and the truth? It is your instructions in the Holy Word of God. So many people will die a spiritual death today because they do not have any knowledge of this Word. And all the people of Israel, all they had to do was be in God's Word each and every day and follow His laws and His commandments and believe His promises. Do you believe His promise to you today? Amen. Do you believe that His Son died and rose again in three days? Yes. Defeating death for you? Hallelujah. Do you believe Him and trust Him to know as soon as you close your eyes of death that you are in the presence of God? Hallelujah. Yes. Can I get an amen? amen. Thank you, Lord. All right, verse 28. And it says, Say unto them, as truly as I live, and like I said, he surely does live. There might be a lot of people in this world that do not believe in him and say he doesn't exist, but he dwells within me. How about you? Yes, sir. Amen. We can feel him, can't we? Yes, sir. Each and every day in our lives, we can feel him. He says unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, now, I want you to pay attention to this verse. So will I, so will I do to you. Let me read it again. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken, surely I will do to you. Now that's a very powerful verse. If you read back to verse, let's let's happen, let's see what they've said in verse, verse two of the same chapter. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? Woo. Now what did he just say was going to happen? I'm going to do to you exactly what's been coming out of your mouth. Folks, you better believe it. You better believe it. They are still blaming God for their condition. You know, He's still taking care of them. Even though He told them to go back in the wilderness, He's still feeding them the manna from heaven. Amen. He's still giving them water. Amen. He's still supplying their clothes. Because He loves them. 
I'm sorry, if you deserve punishment from God, kiss the paddle. You better be glad He loved you enough to correct you so you get yourself out of your dead gum messes that we get ourselves into today. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Let's see what else it says. I'm going to turn to Jeremiah about those that claim the burden of the Lord. I'm going to go to Jeremiah chapter 23. Hold your places because I'll be coming back to Numbers. Starting with verse 33. And when this people, or the prophet, or the priest, shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? How many times have you heard somebody blame God for their circumstances? Why did God let this happen to me? God didn't let nothing happen to you. You happened to you. <laughs> what is the burden of the Lord? What shall then say unto them? What burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. You're making a bad mistake when you go to blame to God for your problems. Now you know and I know that we get ourselves in trouble by the things that we do. God doesn't do it. Verse 34, And as for the prophet and the priest and the people that shall say, The burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his house. Verse 35, Thus shall ye say everyone to his neighbor and everyone to his brother, what hath the Lord answered and said? What hath the Lord spoken? So what has the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more. For every man's word shall be his burden. Is that not what he just said in Numbers chapter 14? Amen. And ye have perverted the words of the living God of the Lord of hosts, our God. Alright, going back to the book of Numbers. <clears throat> Verse 29. Your carcasses shall fail or shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, questioning God's overall plan. Now I got news for you. If you try to get in the way of God's overall plan, He will remove you from the equation. Because His plan is perfect, and it's going to come to pass exactly as, as it's written in this Bible. There's nothing you can do to change that. But if you try to get in the way of that, He will take you out of the way. I can't help but think of Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 3, when it talks about the dry bones. And it's talking about those that are spiritually dead today. And I think about the carcasses that fall. How many do you think are going to fall? How many do you think have already fallen today? But you know what? What else did Ezekiel 37 say? God spoke to the prophet and He told him to go out there and preach to those dry bones. Amen. And as they preached to those dry bones, all of a sudden the skin and the flesh and all those things started coming up upon them. And the Holy Spirit of God breathed life yes. into them. Yes. So what are we supposed to do today? We've got carcasses laying in the valley today. We've got to go out and we've got to spread the Word of God. We've Amen. got to spread the Gospel, folks. Amen. Because when you do that, God will touch them with the Holy Spirit. Now whether they choose to accept it or not, that's totally up to them. But we have got to be in the valley preaching to the dry bones. We, well, God will make the difference working through us. Alright, verse 30. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb and the son of Jeconiah and Joshua the son of Nun. Two people out of 2.1 million and that generation will go into the promised land. Now understand something. God's still going to keep His promise because He's not going to put that on their children. So eventually Israel would walk into the promised land. But is it really any surprise to you that that many people were lost at that time? Look what's happening today. In the book of Revelations, it says that there are only 144,000 of God's children that will have the seal of God in their foreheads in this generation. 
we're going to have a lot of dry bones out there that need to be preached to. Amen. <clears throat> now imagine that. 144,000 out of 12 billion people between who have already passed on and the people that are on this earth. Man, that's terrible. But did He not give us a choice? Alright, verse 31. But your little ones which ye said should be prey, and the word prey here means slave, but your little ones which ye say would be slaves, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. Therefore, keeping His promise, He would deliver the children of that generation into the promised land. Amen. So therefore the sea line continues. Therefore it comes to pass exactly as God said it would and He will bring them into the promised land before His enemies. Will God not bring me and you into the promised land before our enemies? Do you know your enemies will bow knee at your feet? You know why? Because you're going to be standing with Jesus Christ. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. <clears throat> Proverbs 18.21 And I read this, I believe, last week. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, folks. When you put things out of your mouth and you put it out there into existence, you can bring whatever it is, whether it's positive or negative, back to yourself in your life. Now what did God do to them with their murmuring complaining? Oh, would the Lord just have us die in the wilderness? Well, guess what? They're going to die in the wilderness. So we have to be very, very careful of the things that come out of our mouths. Yes, do you trust God? I hope so. Because God loves you so much. That Matthew 12, 36, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Now that's a scary thing. Because I know we get mad sometimes. We lose our tempers and we say things and we may curse and do whatever. I mean, but not only that, just the negativity in general. So if you're murmuring and complaining, are you not doubting God? Yes, sir. Are you not doubting His Word? Are you not doubting His promises? Yes, you are. Amen. And no matter what we go through today, you should have that peace about yourself because we have the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we have the promises of God. Alright, verse 32. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness. How many people will not make it into the promised land? It is so, so very sad. Verse 33. And your children shall wander in the wilderness for 40 years and bear your hordes until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. Do you remember how many days the spies spied out the promised land? Forty days, right? Forty days. They will get one year for every day that they spent over there scouting out the promised land. Let me ask you a question. God didn't tell them to scout out the promised land. Why would God tell them to do that? Because He made it. I mean, He already knew what the promised land. He already told them there were giants in there. Did He not? Has He not told you that you're going to face giants today in your life? Amen. And obstacles that you don't think that you can get through or go around? Yes. But God will let us have victory over our enemies if you trust Him. That's, right. That's an if. If you trust Him. Maybe the next generation will appreciate God. Verse 34. After the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquity even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Again, it was not God's idea. The breach of promise means to alter my purpose. You're not going to alter God's plan. He's not going to allow you to do that. Alright, verse 35. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in the wilderness. They shall be consumed and there they shall die. Would they say, hey, let us appoint a captain to take us back to Egypt. We would have been better off if we had just stayed in Egypt than slavery. That was the tenth time or the ninth time that they had tempted him. After all that God did, but he still has compassion on us. I mean, I've made some bad mistakes in my life. 
and God has had compassion on me and brought me back. But you got to look up and quit looking back. That's right. You keep looking back, you can't never move forward, folks. If God can forgive you for what you've done, then you need to forgive yourself. Amen. Does the Word not say that you cannot be forgiven unless you forgive? That includes you. That's right. And you can never move forward with your life until you forgive yourself. Galatians 6, 7, For whatsoever a man soweth, so shall he reap. Verse 36, And the men which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slanders, or slander upon the land. They gave a slanderous report. They lied to the congregation of Israel and said, We can't take that land. Did God not say that He was going before them? Yes, He did. Do you trust Him? Do you believe in Him? Verse 37, Even those men that did bring the evil report upon the land died by a plague before the Lord they were struck down by sudden death. I tell you what, it's a good thing we've got an advocate in heaven called Jesus Christ. Because by God, when God got upset back in those days, He'd just take your life. But now we've got that perpetuation. I have a hard time saying that word. If it wasn't for that, we'd still have God angry all the time with us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Alright, verse 38. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jeconiah, which were of the men uh, that went to search the land, still lived. 2 Peter 3.10. Can't help but make the point about this. <clears throat> So them old boys are standing right there and then ten of them, sudden death, they fell to their deaths. But those two were still standing there. 2 Peter 3.10 So many people are afraid of the tribulation. They're scared to death and that's because churches and ministers teach you to be afraid and we don't have to be afraid. See, those two were still standing. 2 Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise. And the enemy shall melt with a favorite heat. The earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. Did those two get burned up? Did they die? No. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when the king threw them in the fiery furnace, and he looked in there and there were four men walking around instead of three, and they came out, they didn't even smell like smoke. We have nothing to fear of the tribulation. God's hand will be on us. Alright, verse 39. And Moses did, told these things unto the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. I mean, they wailed and they cried and they carried on. But guess what? They asked for it. And they got exactly what they deserved. Now this is the part when I said when I started this sermon is just unbelievable after all that has been done after them tempting God so many times their lack of faith and their lack of trust yet God still had compassion on them. Verse 40. And when they rose up early in the morning and got them up in the top of the mountain saying, Lo, we be here and, and we will go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised us for we have sinned. What did God say back in verse 25? Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley to tomorrow. Turn ye and get you into the wilderness by the Red Sea. They didn't believe Him. Even in judgment, they did not believe Him. And they did. They, they disobeyed a direct commandment from God. You turn and go back into the wilderness by the Red Sea. And what do they do? They go up there to the top of the mountain and say, Here we are, Lord. We're ready to accept the promised land now. That's because they figured out what their, what their punishment was going to be. You're going to be corrected by God when you make mistakes and mess up. Amen. Yes, you can repent for it and God forgives you for it, but you still, is that not a part of growing who we are today? If it hadn't been for all the mistakes and all the things I've done in my life, God probably wouldn't have been able to use me when I'm standing up here before you preaching the Word of God. We grow from our mistakes. 
it makes us better people, especially when we trust the Lord and we repent and try to get up and do better each and every day. It's too late. Again, what got them in this place in the first time? In the first place, it's unbelief. They even had unbelief in his judgment, in his correction. All right, verse 41. And Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper you? He's trying to reason with them. Don't do it. Don't do it. God has given you a commandment, and this is what you're supposed to do. Let me ask you something. Has God given you the commandments today? It's right here. Everything's written how we're supposed to conduct ourselves and live our lives in this world today. It's right here in this Bible. Verse 42. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. When God was with them, they didn't have the courage to go fight. Now God is not with them, and suddenly they found the courage to go fight. It's too late. Verse 43. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword. I just lost my place. Uh, because ye are turned away from the Lord, therefore the Lord will not be with you. So I go back and I read verse 3 of the same chapter again. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword? But our wives and our children should be prey. Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? They're getting exactly what they put out there. They're getting exactly the words that came out of their mouth. They are fixing to die by the sword because they did not believe God. Let's see here. First Chronicles 28, 9. I love this verse and it is instructions from David to his son Solomon. And it is some very good advice for us today to follow. And thou, Solomon, my son, know that the God of the Father and serve Him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all imaginations of the thoughts. He knows what you're thinking right now sitting in those pews. Amen. He knew what I was thinking sitting right there when I was listening to the music. He knows your heart. He knows your needs. Serve Him with a pure heart. Seek Him and He will be found of thee. But if thou forsake Him, He will cast thee off forever. Verse 44. But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. They went anyway. God gave them a commandment. They were not listening to God. Moses tried to, tried to reason with them. They didn't listen to Moses. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. That word presumed here actually means elated. I mean, they were elated to go up there. Verse 45 to conclude this chapter. Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill and smote them and discomforted them even unto Hormah. Dis Discomfited means they were crushed. They were annihilated by God's enemies. They would not go into Canaan because of their unbelief. They don't accept God's punishment because they're still in unbelief. Can I get an amen? amen. Everyone please bow your heads.